standing by. To the uh, Sunset Safari, you forgive my giggling. Jandre was warming up the tripod, which is quite an aggressive movement. And those Impala suddenly took uh, a liking to it. They've been staring at Jandre ever since. Uh, my name's Brent, and welcome to the middle of the African bush. Very exciting news. Uh, we have a new interviewee trying out, and she's going to be on Wendy. And her name is Tyler, so she'll be coming through to say hello shortly. And of course, I have the long haired. Smelly ruffian Jandre on Aww. camera. There we go, there he is. And Dave is out with Tyler and of course Final Control. I think today is Chelsea and Rebecca. So our plan is we're gonna start heading towards the east. I still haven't seen those sticks cubs and I'm hoping they've headed through to a three in a row pan for a little drink of water. And it is a beautiful day, it's cleared up, the clouds broken up. So I'm very excited and happy to have you on this live African safari. And if you want to ask me any questions, uh, you can email me questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So we had no sign of any Karula tracks this morning. We checked this area, but we know Queen Karula, she likes to walk around during the day. So I just thought on our way down towards a cheetah plains, we'll have a quick look, see if we can find any tracks. And good news as well, I know a lot of you have been asking about my trail cameras and uh, I was a bit nervous to set them out due to spotted hyenas, but I have now got some steel casing uh, if a hyena really wanted to, uh, he could chew through this, but I'm hoping that it'll just make it that little bit more difficult so they might just give up. Now, the other problem with trail cameras, believe it or not, is elephants who tend to like to play with them. So a good trick is always warm up some elephant dung on them and that sometimes helps to stop the ellies picking them up and playing with them. Oh, time to put my hat on quite bright this afternoon but I must say I'm quite enjoying the sunshine after the chilly morning I wonder where all the elephants are I am hoping if the lions are not around uh, that the elephants might be at three in a row pan. Uh, sorry, I've made a huge faux pas. It is a Taylor, not Tyler. Sorry about that. So, well, without further ado, let's go meet Taylor. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's Sunset Drive with Safari Live. Some of you may have seen me earlier this morning I was dangling off the back of Jamie's vehicle. Um, I think you thought I was someone else, but my name is Taylor and I'm here for an interview. So we're going to see how this is, how this goes this afternoon. Sorry, I've got a bit of an issue with my earpiece. Seems to be wiggling out my ear. However, you won't believe it. They've just equipped these vehicles with a new navigation system. And coincidentally, the voice on this one sounds like Jamie. So uh, she's going to be on board making sure that I uh, don't get into too much trouble. Don't go on. She gets into plenty of trouble. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm not too new to this industry. I've been guiding for a few years now, and um, I'm sure you've probably got loads of questions for me. So if you'd like to pop me any questions, you're more than welcome to either do so via Twitter. You can just hashtag Safari Live with your questions, or otherwise you could uh, also send us an email, and uh, that's questions while at wildearth.tv. So but my earpiece keeps popping out. I'm not used to these things anymore. Um, so basically this afternoon, I'm very new to this area. I've been working down in the, the southern, southwestern sector of the Sabi Sand. So quite different up here. But uh, Jamie's going to help me head down towards one of the watering holes. And we're going to see what's happened. It's warmed up quite nicely. The clouds seem to be moving off. 
the wind is picking up a little bit. Um, maybe we get lucky, maybe some elephants come down to drink, maybe a buffalo or two wallowing around. Um, and that's sort of the plan for this afternoon. Maybe as the sun starts to set, we'll head on over to where we had uh, Shadow Strap, who is a leopard I've heard lots about, but um, I'd love to get the opportunity to see her and her cub. So Jamie's going to direct me now towards this watering hole. And uh, yeah, it's a really beautiful day today. Everybody, <laughs> come on, send some questions. Otherwise, I'll go on and on and on about myself, and uh, you might get a bit bored with that. Hello, Valeria. So, I'm not sure if you're a regular viewer or not. Um, so, I'm sure you see, probably, if you're lucky, you've seen quite a few different presenters. Um, one of my favorite bush experiences is probably watching an elephant cow give birth. Um, it, was, it was really an amazing moment. It was a little bit dramatic at the same time. Unfortunately, the elephant was, uh, was born stillborn, so it didn't make it. But the whole interaction with the herd and how they came around to try and help and try and get this little one to stand up before they realized that it unfortunately wasn't, wasn't alive um, was incredible. It brought tears to everybody's eyes on the vehicle. Um, and I've never really been able to experience something like that again and I don't think many people can say that they've seen something like that. So pretty much anything to do with elephants, um, I've had great experiences with them but that's probably my favourite. So I think what we're going to do now is we're going to carry on making our way towards this uh, dam. We've still got quite a bit of a drive to do. Um, hopefully when we get there we'll see something great. We're going to switch back over to Brent and uh, see if he's managed to pick up anything else on, on Karula. Enjoy. Unfortunately no sign or fresh sign should I say of the Queen, only the tracks from yesterday. So we're going to start making our way to the east. Now, the jackalberry is busy fruiting at the moment, so it's always a good spot to stop. And this morning we had green pigeons and grey go-away birds. And today, I only see a single grey go-away bird. Mm, yeah. But the one thing I actually think on my way back this evening, I might set up a trail camera around this tree because lots of different species like civet, jackal, um, sometimes even leopard and hyena might eat the fruits of the jackal berry. There's the great go away bird. Oh, sorry, Chandra. Mm -hmm. Being naughty and not watching my monitor. There are beautiful, big, old African every Definitely over 500 years old, that particular one. And see if this one's fly, uh, fruiting as well, because this would be a, a great place to put a trail camera, because there's another smaller tree we could attach it to. And this one doesn't look to be fruiting. Hmm, interesting. So we're going to have to make a plan when we come back a bit later. Who knows, maybe we'll catch Queen Karula on a camera trap. Um, I'm trying to see. Oh, it moves, but do you see it? Orange breasted bush rock. Uh, let's just try to sneak a sneak of it further forward. It's an incredibly beautiful bird. Oh, no, that's not it. And I'd really, really like to show you. It is magnificent. One of the harder birds to get on camera. The bush rocks are true skulkers as they move through the. Just to jump behind the branch on that one there. About there. It's hopping around in that thicket. I'm hoping it's gone up a bit. You got it in there? Yeah. There. So let's hope it jumps out and gives us a, a good show of its gorgeous colours. Oh, 
all flies away. Oh, and you still got him there? Let's go forward a little bit or back. Okay, let's go back a bit. This bush strike is giving us some. Ah, oh. <laughs> because he skipped. Um, but I just got an, a lovely message from Mia. Hi, Mia. Mia's three years old. And she says she's very happy I'm back and she's missed me on the screen and wants to know if I'm happy to be back and did I miss them. Uh, Mia, of course I missed everyone, you especially. Uh, thanks for joining us on the safari, Mia. And uh, it is great to be back and so I'm so happy to be taking you guys out on drive. So Mia, why don't you let me know what you want to see today? Uh, let me know and we'll see if we can find it for you. Okay, now hopefully we do get another chance at one of those bush strikes. They are incredibly beautiful uh, birds. With two main species we get here is the orange breasted and the grey headed. Um, grey headed, and strangely enough, most of them have both of them have grey heads and orange breasts. Uh, the grey headed is quite a lot bigger though. Always a good spot to check for Karula. And the hyena tracks. Okay. Oh, this area, we have seen Krula in quite a few times recently, but it's quite close to the boundary uh, with Tandi. So her daughter is a little bit further to the east. Now, one hopes that soon we'll get the opportunity to see Tandi's cub. That cub can't be more than a month old at the moment. Uh, I haven't heard if she's moved the den site from underneath that she could cheat the room nine deck. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether she might possibly move a little bit further east into Torchwood or northeast into Torchwood. Or will she go south towards Marnamala? We'll have to wait and find out. Even better it would be if she moved it into the little river system. Uh, around Cheetah Plains Lodge. That would be wonderful for us. What was that? Just saw a little bit of movement. Uh, ah, there we go. It's a zebra. Hiding in the bush there. And looks like some impala behind them. Here we go. Hello, Zebra. You can see that little shimmering action to try to keep the flies at bay. It's a little nerve reaction, almost like a tick. You'll notice a lot of the animals do that to try to keep the stable flies away. Now, stable flies are the most common biting fly we get here in the Sabi Sands. And not only do they sometimes attack the zebras, the lions, and the leopards. They occasionally attack cameramen and presenters too. Violent little bloodsuckers. So it looks like all the lions from Juma, the Kahumas, Birmingham's, have gone north to feast on that elephant that died. So that's not great news for us, but it seems fortunately the sticks have answered our call and have popped out down a cheetah plain. So I'm really hoping they finished the kill down there, but three in a row pan or cheetah plains pan are quite close. So I'm thinking after that full belly, it's been quite cool today. I'm hoping they've moved towards one of those two water holes. And I'm quite excited. I've never seen the sticks cubs. And uh, uh, fingers crossed they're around. So 
this little road up ahead here on the right is sort of the unofficial uh, boundary between Karula being this side and Shadow, I mean Tandi being that side. And very similar to what Impala Plains is between Shadow and Karula. Now of course we do seem to see Tandi quite often as we drive down to Cheetah Plains around the Mowanini drainage. And uh, speaking of the Mulwanini drainage, uh, we're about to go into it, so it is a spot <coughs> oh, excuse me, uh, where we sometimes do lose signal, but you'll stay with me as we have a peer over the edge, see if there's interesting up ahead. into the Mulwanini River and we're going to lose you for a few seconds so while we do that let's go back to Taylor who's got a great grey amphibious beast. So I believe that Brent hasn't had much luck with Karula's tracks and I eventually made my way over to this dam. It did take us a while, I'm not driving very fast today. And we came across a lovely hippo bull wallowing in the water. As you can see, he's got uh, two blacksmith lapwings as companions. And um, unfortunately, this is actually a natural watering hole. It is man-made, however, the, the water that's been captured here is natural. And it's now not so much a dam anymore, it's become a pan. And it's, it's very, very sad that uh, all this water is, is drying up so early in the year already. But um, lucky for this hippo, if he gets out early enough, he might be able to trek and look for a little bit of grass. And it's actually not uncommon now, especially in the last few days that we've had the cooler weather, to actually see hippos up and moving around, which is quite nice to see. Um, that's probably one of the biggest requests we as field guides have is can we see a hippo out of the water? And in the summer months, it's a little bit more difficult, but in winter, um, it seems to be much more of a better opportunity to see this. So I reckon if you had to hang around with this hippo for a few hours, I think he'd come out when he felt comfortable and, and wandered around. There you go, doing a little move around there. Hello, James, Richard, a warm welcome to you. That's um, a very common question that we are asked in this industry. I've been very fortunate to grow up in South Africa, and I have to say thank you very much to my family because the holidays that I've always done are safari holidays. And um, since I was a, a young lass, I've been heading out to safaris, mainly in Kruger, so that if I started crying, I didn't bother anybody else because we were in my parents' car. I just annoyed them. And as I started to get older and behaved a little bit better, we then started to go through to private game reserves throughout South Africa. So I'm originally from the Eastern Cape, from Port Elizabeth, actually, which is about a nine-hour drive east of Cape Town. It's a little coastal city. And there's some really, really wonderful private game reserves out in that area. So I've been heading in those, and that sort of... Uh, push direction for for a while and I kind of expected to go into it and um, <clears throat> when end of high school came I actually tell you a funny story quickly um, while while in high school my mom bought me a book it was called back to the bush and uh, I'm pretty sure if any of you know who Mr. James is he actually wrote that book and he was one of my inspirations to get into this industry he made it seem so fun and, and amazing and so after school um, wanted to go to Australia to study equine dentistry to be a horse dentist growing up with horses my whole life and then I just remembered you know what that's actually not for me I'm not a city girl I like the bush so I had an opportunity to go and study at one of these environmental training centers went and did that uh, and f fortunately did okay, got a job, and then started from there. So, um, and I thought, oh, Dad, you know, I'll just do this for a few years just to make a bit of money, and then I'll go back to Australia and, and go and study. Well, it's five years later, and I'm still here, and I have no, no regrets and, and, and no desire to go and work anywhere else but in the bush. So I hope that answers your, your question, James. Um, but, yeah, that's really good. The bush life is, is lots of fun. It's not for everybody. Um, the thing about this job is that it's a lifestyle. You, you tend to move away 
from <clears throat> your home, you, you, you miss out on family, family occasions and weddings and holidays and things like that. But um, to do what I do is, is pretty amazing. So it looks like this, uh, this hippo is just um, following around for the moment. You can see a few wet marks, so like we saw earlier, he moved a little bit. He'll probably just keep rolling around just to keep himself nice and moist. Unfortunately, there's not enough water um, to ideally cover him, which he would prefer. So they are quite susceptible to sunburn, but the mud helps protect them from that. And I'm sure it's been mentioned before, but they have a secretion um, that they secrete, which is often known as blood sweat or hipposudoric acid. And that actually contains a mild sunblock so, and also an antiseptic. So that helps, helps them keep nice and cool. But you'll see him every now and then. He'll sort of stand up, move around, do a roll over. If you're lucky, you might see him do a complete roll, which is quite, quite rare to see. And he'll just happily lay here until he decides to jump out and go and get something to eat. Hello Val. Um, so I started off in the Eastern Cape, like I said, at, at 19, very young. And um, I worked there for a few years in a, a really wonderful um, private game reserve. Uh, after that, I had an opportunity to move to Zambia, where I did a short stint in management. But I decided that I didn't like the paperwork that came with management. And to me, it was just an office job in the bush. So you got taunted by all the wonderful elephants and lions and things that would come up and around you but you were never really able to go out and and experience it um, and I was very jealous of all the guides that would come back and say oh we, you won't believe what we saw we watched the leopard killing an impala and taking it up a tree and I thought you know management's just not for me let's uh, let's head back to South Africa and, and that's where I was fortunate enough to, uh, to get an opportunity down in the southwestern corner of the Sabi Sands, where I'm currently, where I've been based for the last year. And it's incredible. This, the Sands is probably the most amazing place. The, the wildlife is so diverse. The, um, and with that, with the plant species, the birds, it's, it's just amazing. It's like something I've never really experienced before. And, and the, the predator density, the leopards, the lions, the hyenas, I don't even need to go on about this. You guys watch this show every single day. Um, for instance, those lion cubs this morning, that was amazing. I don't know when I last saw eight lion cubs together. That was, so that was really, really, really special. Um, yeah, so those are the areas that I've worked in. I hope to stay in the sands. Uh, I have no, no intention of leaving just yet. So we'll see where the road takes me next. <laughs> Angie from Ohio, goodness gracious, you're a long way away from us. Hello. Um, so, as you know, the leopards and the lions of the Sabi Sands are probably the most famous animals in the world. They've all even got their own Facebook pages for the new viewers that didn't know that. Um, so we were very fortunate. We see quite a few different species of different individual leopards. Um, quite a, um, a well-known male leopard that everybody might know, Mashabeni, or uh, it's spelt Maxabeni if, you, if you've just maybe seen the spelling. Um, so he's our resident uh, leopard in, in the northern sector of the reserve. Um, and then we've got obviously quite a few, quite a few females that we see, from Little Bush to her daughter Kaigelia, from Lisbon, Queen of the South, who is my absolute favourite leopard. We've also got Kalenge. We see Warthog Wallow, um, and and quite a few other species, uh, other individual leopards too. Occasionally we see Matlatin, one of the other males, but uh, he he sort of tends to have his tail a little bit further south. Um, yeah, that's. That's really, really all that can come to mind. The butterflies in my stomach are, are fluttering away, so uh, I see <laughs> I'm uh, forgetting every now and then a few of the animals that I, I see every day. <laughs> so hopefully they'll settle down later on in the drive and uh, I'll be able to, to uh, carry on with a few other names. But uh, thanks for that question, Angie. That's, that's nice. And I hope some of those names seem familiar to you. Otherwise, go and have a look at them, some really beautiful leopards. So I think what we're going to do now is... <laughs> Fantastic. So we're going to carry on down the eastern boundary. We're going to take a little bumble 
like uh, Jamie said, let's go on an adventure. I don't know the property very well, so I'm keen to just take a little bumble. I'd be so excited if I can see some elephants, which are my favorite animal. Um, and uh, we're going to head back over to Brent and uh, see what happens and, and uh, now that he's arrived safely on Cheetah Plains. So see you in a bit. I'm just having a look. I saw some tracks here. And it I'm not sure for a second. Look like a male leopard. So there's some male leopard tracks here. Oh, that's very loud. Let's turn that one down. And they look quite fresh, so from during the day, on top of the vehicles from this morning, heading towards Three and Pan. I wonder, is Mr. Q around? One of my favourites. So as we know with Mr. Q, always check the termite line. Sorry, yeah. Missed that update. It sounds like they might have found quarantine, unfortunately, just to the north of us. So this is definitely pretty sure these are his tracks here. And they're very fresh. Peter, Peter. Try again just now when we get a bit closer. The tracks seem to have left. Could have gone to the north, but anyway, maybe he'll come down to three in a row pack. So uh, one of the nice things about the dry season is there's not many options uh, where you can drink. So, uh, fingers crossed, the lions might be at three in a row pan with the leopard, you never know. Peter, Peter. Uh, Peter, what uh, do you have there? Okay, Kobe, thanks. Uh, tracks of a male leopard uh, cross into your side just before Jacobin camp from Igwe Road. Okay, so um, just to let you know, there's a Birmingham boy who's got his own buffalo down there. So I wonder if the sticks are not going to go join him. Uh, hopefully, they haven't made it there yet. So only one male line. So we might do a loop back to see if we can find Mr. Q a little later. And let's just go check if these lions have come for a drink three in a row pack. Now, as I approach three in a row pack, I always get a little bit excited, uh, especially because of quarantine, the male leopard. And it always pays to actually look in the trees. What did you see? Oh, I thought John had spotted him. Wouldn't that be nice, Yandre? So last time we actually saw, I oh don't know, not the last time, one of the last times we saw Mr. Q, Yandre actually spotted him direct way up in a tree. And we're always worth having a good look in the trees and termite mounds around here. I do love young male leopards. They're such, such good quality viewing. Always up to something. Connor, Jerry Connor would like to know, do we go on to daylight saving times during our different seasons? We don't, so we're quite lucky. We, it's very, pretty much the same for most of the year. There's not too much difference, so no need for us to go on to daylight saving out here. I do see a fawn-colored creature up ahead, but it is not a lion. It is an impala. Oh, but... It, 
Now, looks like three in a row pattern has dried up since I was last year. So maybe those lines might have moved towards Cheetah Plains pad. Oh no, there's some water on that side. Okay. Now it's time to start checking carefully for lion tracks. Or leopard tracks. Careful Impala, Mr. Q might be around the corner. Doesn't look like they came up here. So I'm going to head back to where Jamie last had them this morning. John, you were with Jamie? So you know where they were? There we go. Okay. We're just down from three in a row pad. Oof, sun disappeared, got a little chilly there. haven't headed back to the west. Uh, no sign of any tracks yet. Uh, Jandro, are they east or west of this junction? To the east, okay. Well, there's a good chance if they haven't gone to three in a row pattern, they might have gone to Cheetah Plains pan. There's very little water to the south. Hi Jennifer. Jennifer said she thought the three in a row pan was pumped and which other pans are? It is Jennifer but they alternate pumping it uh, with a Cheetah Plains pan. So They'll either pump one or the other, not both at the same time normally, and then they'll let it dry out naturally and then pump to another thing. It's to try to keep the animals not constantly staying in one spot, it's to make them move so they don't decimate the area around that pan. Now lots, lots of elephant tracks, so it's always possible the lions might have been chased away by the ellies. Kitty, kitty, kitties, where are thou? Mm, oh, so we're very close to where they were. Now, of course, lions are being lazy creatures, so to speak. Oh, let's say, let's not say lazy, let's say lions being creatures that conserve energy. Uh, they might just be sleeping in the same spot. Here we go, we're on the southern boundary of Cheetah Plains. We are going east. Well, Mia who's three years old, and I asked Mia what did she want to see on drive today, and Mia said she'd be really happy to see some Ellie's. Well, Mia, it seems like you must have the best luck in the world, because as I got your question, there are elephants in front of me. Oh, I see a vulture on the ground beyond the Ellie's, so I'm presuming that's where the lions were. Yeah, jean is nodding his head vigorously. Hello, elephants. So there's a little breeding herd of Ellie's here, just for me.
Now, I wonder if these elephants have chased the lions. So there we go. Hello, little one. Okay. So, just up, there we go, we've got the eddies over here. And I still see... There's quite a few ellies and some more in the bush behind us. There we go, there's three bottoms in a row. Now the wind is coming from the east and that vulture is sitting on the ground. but It's not going into the bush. So I wonder, have the lions been lazy? And are they still lying there? And that's why the vulture's sitting at bay. Hmm. Well, let's go have a quick look. We're going to pop back to Mia's eddies in a second. Now, with the wind coming from that way, it's possible that the elephants didn't smell the lions. Oh, no. Oh, lots of vultures. And... <laughs> that is not the most graceful landing, little hooded vulture. Shame. And they have been doing their job very much so. Oh, I don't see any. I do see. I don't see which way the lions went from here. But they have literally, absolutely. What was it? A kudu. I have literally absolutely decimated between the vultures, there we go, and everything else. Oh. Let's hope I don't have a growling bush. But we can see here, there's almost nothing left. I just want to have a look for tracks here. You can see there's just one, two, three, four legs, the rib cage, and the pelvis. Now these lions must have been seriously hungry. Because, oh, and the vultures have been hungry. There's almost just only sinew left on this. You see that? Just that really tough sinew. I mean, you can see I can't even pull it off. It smells fresh. Now, so, not an unpleasant smell, it's the smell of meat. Now, which way did the lions go? Let's have a quick look on the road here. Is it? But the problem is these tracks, there could be tracks all over the place. And so the Ellie's are on, so the Ellie's might have traced them. Audio. Let's keep checking towards Cheetah Plains Pan. There's tracks going in all directions. I can see the cub tracks here. What up, what up, what up. Uh, but those tracks are being driven on. Hmm. Time to work out the puzzle. But before we rush off, in search of the lions, uh, we mustn't forget to enjoy what is here. So let's just go back a bit. Lion tracks, why are you going that way? That's not very nice. Here we go. So our bird was saying the hyenas haven't found it yet. No, they haven't. And even for a hyena, it's quite slim pickings what's left of that kudu. Maybe the leg bones. Here we go. Nice big Ellie cow and some youngsters. Munch, munch, munching away. 
Now, if you can remember how much an adult bull elephant can eat in a day. So if you know how much food an adult bull elephant can eat in a day, uh, let me know. So pop me an email, questions at wildearth.tv, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So yeah, I'm just going to keep quiet. I thought I heard an alarm call. Yes, okay, I've got some alarm calls up ahead. Sound quite far. Sounds like it could be on that open, the big open area at Cheetah Plains. So maybe they might even be Cheetah today. I just hear a kudu barking. Bah! Bah! It could, of course, be the lions. Just trying to make sure they just haven't moved off. I'm looking for big fatties sleeping somewhere. While we zoot off to see what that kudu is alarm calling at, uh, let's see how Taylor's faring back on Juma. So, I uh, wonder, has anybody uh, got the elephant question right yet? So how much does an elephant bull eat on a daily basis? Come on guys, I'm sure there's a few of you that must have heard the answer to that a few times. Speaking of elephants, we've been trailing a big elephant bull's track for probably about the last five minutes now. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, elephants are one of my favorite animals. So I'm very excited, especially that uh, I've been on holiday for two weeks in the concrete jungle and it's not my favorite place. So I'm absolutely itching to see an elephant. So I'm just going to quickly jump out and we're going to have a look at this elephant track. Let me quickly remove the earpiece. Let's see if I can get out. Right here. Hmm. So, I think uh, let's go to this one over here. No, if it's quite difficult to see, but it's it's a really nice, lovely, fresh track. Um, and there's actually two tracks over here. And if you look very carefully on this one, this foot over here, you can actually see the toe print, which is, is, is an easy way to tell which direction the elephant's going. It looks like a fairly large bull, um, and he's going in the direction of a watering hole. Um, so most likely he's going to go and have a drink, and what I'm really hoping for, which would be the absolute cherry on top, is if he's actually trailing a breeding herd. That's often what big bulls will do. They live a solitary life once they get kicked out of the herd. And, um, and then they'll spend their lives moving through the bush, looking for girls, checking if they're in estrus or not. Um, so we're gonna stick on his tracks. He's been very kind to walk along this wonderful road. And it seems, well, I've got some inside intel that uh, he possibly looks like he's going the direction of the dam. So that's what we're gonna carry on doing. So let me get back in again, get my favorite e earpiece on. And, um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna mosey on over. I don't think we're too far from the dam now. My GPS tells me that it's just around the corner. So just uh, bear with us for a few minutes. We may even come across this bull um, before we get to the dam, which will be fine too. Right. So these, these tracks look nice and fresh. Um, it's quite easy to tell if a track is fresh or not, especially now that the wind has died down. It's a bit windy earlier this morning, so there hasn't actually been any sand that's blown over into the track. You can see the grooves and the cracks in the feet quite nicely. So I'm fairly confident that there's something around here. There we go. I think this is, this is where we're coming up to. We're going to do a little loop. 
Right. We're waving, we've got another vehicle. Probably thinking, who's this strange blonde? Doesn't seem to be too much water on this side. Hello, Monty. These clouds are a bit deceiving at the moment. So uh, you've asked, do we get any rain at this time of the year? Um, not so much now. Um, it is a bit dry and brown and gray. And uh, we are in the middle of winter at the moment. So we should hopefully start to get rain. If we can get some early rain in September, that'd be nice. But I think probably more likely around October, we had a box of rain last year. Um, it could be very different, though, up further north in the Sabi Sands. You won't believe how localised the weather is. Um, so, so, yeah, these clouds, are, they look all big and scary, but uh, they're not really low enough. There's no big cumio nimbus clouds forming, which is your typical thunderstorm. Uh, so, so, yeah, don't, um, not too much. If, if we did get some rain now, though, I can tell you right now that every single ranger, field guard, manager, presenter will be doing handstands and cartwheels for you. Um, so actually keep your fingers crossed. Let's hope we get some rain. You might see a dance from us. So we've uh, We're arriving. Have we arrived? We need to turn left, yeah. Okay, we, we have arrived. <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there slowly. We're just doing the, the scenic way around. What we're doing, uh, this is an African massage, so just hold on tight here. <laughs> mm, but a bit bumpy. We're going on an adventure. <laughs> James, so I obviously when you start as a, a guide or anybody in this industry, the first thing you learn to do is game drives. Um, so it becomes relatively easy as you go along. Um, I actually prefer walking just because you get to see so many more of the smaller things. And most people, when they come on safari for the first time, they want to see all the big, wonderful animals, which is, of course, great. And that's what keeps people coming back. I mean, who doesn't want to see a lion kill or you know, a herd of elephants wallowing in the water, which I'm hoping to see now. Um, but ideally, when you've gone on safari once, you know, it's great to see those big things. But now that you've seen them and you're, you're very excited, you want to go, what else is out there? I've seen the Impala, I've seen the Kudu, I've seen the Nyala. So that's when you really get a fantastic opportunity to start focusing on the smaller thing, from things like plants to, oh, maybe you really enjoyed birding the first time that you came through. Um, so yeah, so I think walking is probably my favorite. You know, you get to use your senses a lot more as well. You don't hear the rumbling of the vehicle so much. Um, but game drives are fun. Obviously, you get to have wonderful close up close and personal experiences with all the animals if they're allowing you to in the vehicles. You know, when you walk, you don't really focus on the big game so much, which is not always a problem. Sometimes if you're lucky and you come across them and you bump them, you can view them from a distance. Otherwise, you know, things like frogs, that's one of my favorite, but don't tell anybody because people think I'm a bit strange to really have, uh, um, really enjoy amphibians. So I quite love the rain. All the little uh, strange creatures come popping out, which is awesome. But yeah, but thanks for that question. Ah, oh, buffalo, have a look what we've got on the right. It's nice. So not quite elephants, but close enough. You no, know, have a quick look with my binoculars. It's always nice to use your binoculars when you're out in the bush, even though we get to get relatively close to the animals. You can really start to see things like ticks and scars and all sorts of strange markings, which is really nice. And if you have a look, one big dugger boy or big buffalo bull that's having a rub on that fallen marula. Having a good old scratch. I think what we're going to do now is I'm just going to take a moment just to appreciate the sighting. It's been a little bit quiet this afternoon. So just for a minute or two, we're just going to sit in silence and just have a look and observe what these, these dugger boys are up to.
So I'm sure some of you are thinking, what on earth are these buffalo doing in this dense sort of section of the reserve? Because I'm sure most of you know, buffalo are related to cows and the Bovidae family, so they eat grass. And this is true, they are bulk grazers. However, at this time of the year, when there isn't much grazing around, I see there's a few sprouts of grass popping up here, but I don't think it's got too much nutritional value. Uh, they're actually very clever. So they're moving through these thicker parts where perhaps some of the other animals have maybe missed bits of grass that are growing underneath, like for example, this fallen marula, or they're underneath some other shrubs, and you'll see them actually trying to move them away and uh, feed on a few sprouts of, of grass. Also, it's not uncommon to see buffalo actually browsing um, at this time of the year, which is quite funny because it was only after about two years of guiding that I actually saw a buffalo browse for the first time, and I was completely shocked because most of the books say that they, they're just bulk grazers, but you see them feeding on apple leaves, round leaf teak, so that's possibly what they could also be after this afternoon. Hello, boys. Oh, we're gonna have a little bit of a scuffle. Oh, wow, look at this. There we go, a little test of a dominance there. Yeah, there we go, you can see this chap on the left, he's nice and proud, he obviously won that battle. Very happy. And all the ox peckers. So these boys are now sort of moving off into some thicker vegetation. It's gonna be quite difficult to follow them through here. Also, we don't want to drive over unnecessary, um, and, and, uh, unnecessarily because, you know, we could squash the last bit of, of the grass. So I think let's uh, pop on over to Brent and see what he's, uh, what he's got up to. I wonder if that uh, carcass is uh, smelling less fresh. But enjoy. So no sign of lions, but there's some eddies. They're not the most relaxed herds, so I'm not going to get too close. Uh, moving away from Cheetah Plains Pan, heading southeast back towards the Kruger. I said they're not the most relaxed, but I'm going to try and get in behind them, so, and then we can watch them as they walk across this big open plain. Also, there's a squirrel alarm calling, so we're definitely going to be checking this area very, very intensely. Now let's just enjoy these wonderful eddies first. You can just see from their body language, they're not 100% relaxed. So I'm not going to go any closer, I'm going to go past them. And we can look at them as they walk away. You can see this female, uh, she's sort of posturing herself to try to keep us away from the babies. Uh, we don't want to stress them out. So you can see, you'll see as we get further away from them, her, her walk should relax a little bit. Okay, that looks like it should be the spot. There we go. You can see they've relaxed down nicely now. Stopping to listen to us. I can see they probably come in from the Kruger and in an area where there's a not a lot of vehicle traffic. So they're not used to vehicles, so we're going to keep our distance. Uh, we want them not to have any negative interactions with cars. So keep our distance a little bit, uh, let them relax, and hopefully they'll stop and start feeding. So everyone is, is right at the elephant, because Rita and Elaine say about 150 kilos, and Chris Rogue says 600 pounds. 
So it is anything from about 150 kilograms to 250 kilograms, which is about 600 pounds for an adult bull elephant. Females, like these ones, probably around 100, 120 to 150 kilos, but an adult male can eat up to 250 kilometers in a sitting. And you can see they are relaxing. Now we stop far enough away from them and they're gonna slowly keep feeding and melt into the bush. Now I'm just also gonna keep quiet for a second to listen. <laughs> Look at the little guy. Hasn't quite mastered that whole trunk thing yet. Uh, more of a game with the guari than feeding. Okay, now Ellie's going to disappear. I want to go do a quick loop uh, down to the red sand section of Cheetah Plains, one of my favorite little areas and always a good place to look for Kanyemi, who's the dominant female leopard in the eastern part of Cheetah Plains. I haven't seen her in such a long time, I'd love to catch up with her. And from what I've heard, even from the guys in Coral, I haven't seen her too often, she's been spending a lot of time in Kruger. And I think that's because quarantine's been in this area and uh, he has chased her a couple of times. For those of you who might not know who I'm talking about, quarantine is a young male leopard uh, who is busy trying to establish territory in the area around Sheets Plains and in Coral. Dorth. Uh, Dorth says, where's Gnormless Gnorm in the Gnu? Dorth, I wish I knew. Uh, he's probably around and he might have been lying up down in the, the thickets in the bottom of that open area. Uh, I don't think he would have moved too far. There's still a fair bit of grass around on the edges for him to sort of scurry about in. But uh, normal Norman's also missing. Uh, I still see Gnorman a few days before I went away, so he is around and uh, maybe he's just resting in that slightly thicker area. It is cold and windy, so it would make sense for him not to be out in the open. But normal Norman's also missing, so hopefully neither of them have met an untimely demise uh, to a large predator. So not only is this a great place to look for in Kanyini, the female leopard, this is where the area where we saw the first and only so far pangolin sighting on Safari Live. And it was on a cold, windy day, very similar to this. So fingers crossed. I know Jandre would literally probably do a leap of joy if we found a pangolin. I might get too excited to speak again. And final control, we'll call it an armadillo. But yes, now that was uh, uh, Rebecca, not sure what it was. Well, Dave, who was on camera that day, even said, what the hell is that? And I was like, oh, the back of it, oh, panics. So much excitement. This is definitely one of my favorite spots on Cheetah Plains, this little area around Buff Pan, magnificent leadwoods, there's another nice one here, and wonderful, wonderful area. Now all we need is a leopard in it. And 
as we go around this corner and see the soil change completely. Always check very carefully in this area. Canyonia does seem to like it a lot. Hi Monique. Monique is wondering about an update on Tingana. And so I just think I saw something in the tree there. Well, Monique, I haven't heard anything about Tingana. The last I think he was seen was to the south of Juma. And uh, I haven't heard anything. I'm sure he's around, you know, out patrolling, being a male leopard, chasing young males, mating with females. But he doesn't really come this far. And this is normally Shavamba Lan's territory, this area out here. And it would be nice to catch up with him as well. So really, really fascinating that quarantine's been behaving how he has. It's been very, very cheeky to Shavamba Lan, and especially for a left of that size, uh, to take almost no notice of a much bigger animal. Okay, so <laughs> no tracks just yet, but there's some incredible little bits of light that are coming through the clouds every now and then. There's one there. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? Now, just up ahead here was actually the first time I saw Inkanyeni and she and her two cubs were actually walking into one of those shafts of light. It was absolutely spectacular. So, fingers crossed that we're going to have something in the shaft of light around the corner. Always checking very carefully. There's some big game trails here. That in Canini likes to use. So I just saw there were some off-road tracks there, but they look a bit old. Okay, so we're coming out onto the Kaul Kaul open area. And this was the first place I Saw in Canini on live drive with both the cubs. Here we go. No dear, nothing out here on the open area. So we're gonna head back towards Cheetah Plains Pan and I'm gonna head back towards three in a row pan, see if any lion tracks coming out. And uh, while we continue our search for feline predators. Uh, let's go see what Taylor's found back up in the north. So as you can see, we've uh, come across a beautiful breeding herd of buffalo. It seems to be buffalo day for me. Uh, we've had absolutely no luck with the elephants. I think they moved off into some very, very dense brush to do some feeding as the sun slowly starts to go down. But um, yeah, down where I'm working, we, don't, we haven't actually been seeing bigger herds of, uh, of buffalo, which is really nice to see. So I'm just going to reposition a little bit. They seem to be moving off. Um, so let's just get into a better spot over here. They're usually quite relaxed. So I sh I'm sure they won't mind us too much encroaching into the herd. But let's, uh, let's go have a look. I do want to say thank you very much to uh, everybody that's online watching us live at the moment. Thank you very much for the positive feedback. It's uh, 
it's encouraging. Um, so the butterflies are slowly disappearing now, but I don't want to get too confident. Uh, so, so yeah, thanks so much, everybody. But um, yeah, have a look at this beautiful buffalo herd. It's very, very exciting. So Penny has just asked, are buffalo teeth the same as cow teeth? So as I mentioned earlier, buffalo being in the Bovidae family along with the wildebeest and cows, I'm pretty sure they all have very much the same tooth structure. They're all grazers, um, so I don't think there'd be too much, much of a difference. So I hope that answers your, your question. As you can see they're moving off now in single file. A few little patties left on the road, which is normally what you see after a herd of buffalo has moved through. Possibly they're on their way to a dam to drink. Maybe they've already, well, it doesn't look like they've actually been in any water. So maybe they're going there to have one last drink before sunset. I think let's follow them for a little bit. Let's just keep on moving and we'll see what they get up to. What's quite nice, I don't know if you can see the, the drongo, the fork-tailed drongo on top of the wattle. Oh, eh, typical birds, as you speak about them, they become camera shy and they fly away. This is very normal. Um, but drongos are often around the larger the mammals, especially something like a buffalo and even around elephants. And they have this amazing symbiosis. So, as the buffalo or whichever herbivore it may be moves through the grass, they're obviously kicking the ground, they're brushing up against a tree and quite a few insects sort of fly around. And this makes for a very easy meal for a drongo. So it swoops down, does a little bit of an acrobatic turn. And um, there's another one. Let's see if we can get one of them to sit still. For those of you who have never seen a fork-tailed drongo, oh my goodness, they're everywhere. Every there's one actually, I just don't want to sit still. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit further. We'll get, we will get a drongo. And we'll just have a quick little look at them because they're really incredible birds. Uh, there's quite a few of them sitting up just on the fallen tree. There's a nice one on a silver cluster, and of course it's gone. Why won't you guys sit still? There we go. There we go. So yeah, watch them. It's, it's incredible how they just swoop down, like I said, they're, they're acrobats of the sky, they're amazing as they, they fly through, swoop down, grab a butterfly or a grasshopper, whatever it may be, take it back to the perch and then gobble it on down. But it seems like these buffalo have had enough of us. I don't know, Jamie, did you put deodorant on today? I didn't, it's, well, I think that's the problem. We put our thumb on the problem. Sorry. Sorry, I had a bit of technical difficulty there. Um, Monique, I'm just going to get FC just to relay that question. There would a Monique, sorry, so you asked, um, are there any calves with this breeding herd? Um, and yes, there will be. Some of them will be a bit older now. Um, you, maybe a few of them have died off. I didn't see any particular, particularly small ones. I saw a few that are sort of around a year. Um, but unfortunately, with the last sort of two cycles of, of rainfall, we haven't, we haven't seen much rain, which then obviously hasn't produced a lot of grass. And that's what the buffaloes like to eat. So sometimes what happens is if the conditions aren't right, um, the females just don't have enough sort of food source to actually even produce a fetus and um, they won't have any calves and, and that's it's quite normal in harsh conditions but when we get enough rain again and uh, and some grass and some grass grows then we will will probably be seeing a lot of calves down in the south we've been seeing a few few youngsters but unfortunately the lions have been picking them off one at a time obviously with mom not producing a lot of milk um, the calves aren't growing as quickly and uh, as strongly as they should. Um, so it's, it's a bit tough for them at the moment. But um, let's keep our fingers crossed that a few of them pull through. Um, it's obviously important to have buffalo every year. I think there's one last female coming through. Ah, got some fantastic news for you all. 
So as we've been chatting, it is buffalo day today, and Brent has got some more buffalo, and they're at a pan. So maybe we get to see some uh, different behavior. So I think we're going to switch on over to him and uh, give you a little buffalo variety. Enjoy. Sorry, guys, I'm just on the Game Drive channel. Andrew, Andrew. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to get an update here. But we are, a little, very small herd of buffalo has come in for a, a drink. I think they've drunk at another pan because not all of them drank. And they're actually heading in almost the exact same direction as those elephants did. But I've just got a report now in my ear for something a little bit more exciting than, than lions. I mean, than buffalo, <laughs> which is lions, so I gave it away. So, <laughs> that was terrible. Oh, bye, buffs. Jamie, Jamie said he's just seen white markings on a buffalo's face. What are they? They are pre-orbital glands. Um, so uh, they are just little glands that secrete, and uh, quite often uh, lots of little bits of information that will be passed between the buffalo by the secretions on those glands. You often see them rubbing them up against bushes and that. Even though buffalo aren't territorial, they do leave a, a bit of a scent behind where they have been. Sorry, I just got to concentrate on the radio for a second. Andrew, Andrew. Andrew, I'm battling to copy on the Eastern Channel. Can you go Northern Channel, please? Afternoon, Andrew. Um, I'd like to make my way towards your position. Uh, is there a standby available? Just leaving CP Pan. Uh, there's a, a small number of uh, nyari that have come down. Copy, thanks very much. Okay, so we two standby. The lions actually seemed like they went back into Malamala and then went back west. But Andrew's found them. Oh dear, very noisy. So there's uh, the tree James had a little argument with. And he, he, he nearly fell out, but he did manage to scratch himself. So that was the one that had the pipe in it. Need to listen. Okay, I can hear them now. Uh, sorry, Andrew, go again. Kobe, thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, confirm at Juma Dam. Copy, thanks very much. Okay. Yay. Copy, thanks very much, Andrew. Yay, we're going to go see the Sticks Cubs. This is going to be my first time. I'm very excited. Jandre, of course, spent the whole morning. He's looking quite blasé about it. So, but it's my first time to see these lion cubs. 
And isn't it incredible how many cubs are around at the moment? So there's six Inkahuma cubs, two Karula cubs, so that's eight, and uh, eight Styx cubs, so 16, one Tandi cub, one Inkanyeni cub, one Shadow cub. So we're on 19. Salah, oh, that's not really a cub, that's a sub adult now. We can't call Salah as a cub yet. Um, trying to think, is there anything else that's got a cub at the moment? Oh, the hyenas must have some cubs, but unfortunately their den has moved to Mala Mala. I mean, not Mala Mala, to Manuleti. We're going down near Mala Mala now. We rush across to those gorgeous leopards. Oh, watch out, Stan Woogie. Uh, let's go back to Taylor, who's with uh, the most numerous antelope in Africa, south of the Sahara. <laughs> Just having a good chuckle here. Um, obviously, Impala, I'm sure all of you have seen at least a photo of an impala, but they're really important animals to have around. This is a nice little group here. There's a couple of young males. I haven't seen the big ram yet. Um, maybe we'll be able to spot him. It's quite thick here. But impala, probably the most common antelope. Actually, they are the most common antelope throughout Africa, and they're a really important food source for a variety of different predators. So. Don't just uh, shrug them off your shoulder. It's good to stop and appreciate and have a look at them, Polly. You can see they're busy munching away. They've found something that they're enjoying that's got a little bit of nutrients. Munching. So what we're actually going to do now is we're not going to stick with these impala too long. What I'd really like to do is head into the direction, seeing as we didn't have any luck with the elephants, and of where we saw those leopard tracks this morning with Jamie. Um, so it was Sandile's tracks that we had, and then we also had Shadow's tracks. So like I keep saying to you guys, I'm very excited to see the other types of leopards up in the northern sector of the Sabi Sands. I hear about them all the time, read about them on Facebook, but um, I've never had the opportunity to see any of them myself. So, And who doesn't love a leopard? Uh, the pattern on the coat is beautiful. So let's mosey on over that way and uh, hopefully maybe we get some fresh tracks maybe that it's cooled down a little bit now maybe one of the leopards have uh, come out and become a bit more active maybe someone's hunted during the day i'm not sure you know you never know what the bush has for you so let's hot head on so let's see what else is happening bye bye impala thank you Hello James, so you've asked, what is my favorite baby animal? Uh, sure, I really enjoy them all, but um, who doesn't love a baby elephant? I think a, a young elephant that's younger than six months old is possibly my favorite. I think they're the most entertaining animals of the bush. When the fact that they're still, you know, training all those muscles in their trunk, it's, it's, it's really hysterical. I think Jamie actually had a really nice sighting of elephants yesterday afternoon if you were with us watching it. And um, that was a prime example of why elephants are my, or baby elephants are probably my favorite baby animal. Uh, it was waving its trunk around, did a bit of a headstand. They get really excited and then to watch, you know, one or two of them sort of wrestle, push each other to the ground, sort of mount each other, that type of thing. That's also really fun to, to watch. So thanks for that question, James. Bye-bye. It's just amazing how the vegetation just changes. All of a sudden we've got a lot of marula trees, so it's quite a sandy crest sort of area over here, which is quite nice. Lots of silver cluster leaves, lots of bush willows. So 
So Kathy's just asked us uh, a lovely question. Um, and I think it's something that also, once again, like the hippo is being seen out of water, everyone would love to see an elephant shake a marula tree. So Kathy's question was, when do marula trees bear the fruit? Every tree is slightly different, um, so it depends on the type of soil um, that it's in and how much water it's got. But anywhere from about February, you'll start to see uh, the fruit uh, quite nicely. Sorry, I'm just getting some directions as we go along. Just saying right. right. <laughs> GPS is right, right. right. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so around February, where I'm from, obviously I, can, I haven't worked up, up this north, but February, March, they sort of uh, start dropping down to the ground and then it's a race. It's a race between the monkeys, the birds, the warthogs, the elephants, and of course, the rangers and anybody else who's ever tasted a delicious marula fruit as to who can collect them. So something that I like to do is if the elephants have thankfully pushed the tree around a little bit and uh, loosened a few fruits, is when that elephant has moved off, I'm quite sneaky. I'll run on in and grab a few, keep them in a little plastic bag, let them ripen for a few days, and uh, my, my tracker and I, we then gobble on them, and if I'm lucky enough to have some guests in the process, they munch on them too, and they're so, so, so delicious. See, now it's changed again. Now it's uh, not as dense as it was before. It's a little bit more open. And the wind has picked up. I thought I moved away from, the, from Port Elizabeth to get away from the wind, but it seems like the last few days, it's, uh, it's been very much like Port Elizabeth. So, I know how much everybody loves the cats, and I know Brent has got a wonderful surprise for all of you. I'm not sure if it is a surprise. Maybe he has told you, but he didn't tell me. Um, so, I'm going to send you on his way and uh, enjoy, and hopefully we're going to find a leopard for you a bit later. So, keep your fingers crossed for us. Do a little dance if you can, and uh, we'll see you guys a little bit later. Look at that! That is what you call an absolute pile of cubs. And my favourite is the, oh, the, the one stretching. He's got such a big belly. And look at that tummy. <laughs> look how big his tummy is. He can't get comfortable. He's so fat, there's no way he can find a comfortable spot to sleep. Look at that. Okay, we're just going to move a bit forward. We just wanted to show you that cub who is lying on his back like that. Just too cute. So this is my first sighting of the Styx cubs. And very exciting. And you can see there's some very full lions around here from this morning. There we go. Has it got a piece of elephant dung there as well? Look at him. I think he's picked up a piece of elephant dung. Or is lying in between the elephant dung. And there's still a few little ones suckling. And... Oh, that's between the legs. <laughs> they are just too cute for words. Definitely think little lion cubs win the cute competition out in the bush. Well, for me anyway, and I know I think James and James definitely agrees with me. And you can see how full all the tummies are, and we had a look at that carcass. How little of that kudu was left? Oh, hello, itchy. Very itchy. Oh, it's a 
Hi, kitty. And then we gotta look at that other one sleeping with mom. Mom! Oh. Looks like a little boy. Isn't that just too sweet? Oh, the other one's taking the opportunity to suckle without any competition. But look how its ears fold back as it, if it, there was competition and they were fighting over a kill. <laughs> Nothing like a foot in the face. Oh, you can see its claws are even out. Play with me, Mom. Play with me. I'm bored. And lionesses definitely have incredible patience. And they are clambered on constantly by these little critters. <laughs> Roll over. Too sweet. <laughs> can you hear them? Oh, there we go. You can see how oh, we got the one on the right it does look like a a little boy. You can see the size difference already. Going to go get into the big sucking rat. Sorry, I just got to be on the radio. Peter, Peter. Sorry, Peter, I was on the eastern side of uh, Cheetah Plains. I don't have good comms there. But those Ingram corns were crossed into Incoro about 300 meters to the west of uh, Jacobin. Copy, good luck. Look at that. So there's literally a pile of cubs there. Getting really stuck in there. Look at the ears going. Oh. Look at that, just lying with mom. Now, of course, it becomes quite difficult when the cubs get to this age to tell exactly who mom is. Uh, there's two lionesses that have had the cubs, and there's lions practice aloe suckling. So it means that they will suckle other members of the pride's cubs. So seeing exactly who mom is can be quite difficult. So if we have a look there, there are eight cubs, and six of them are all in a pile around the one female at the moment. Hi, Patricia Scott. And Patricia's wondering, are they all full from the dead elephant? No, they're all full from a kudu that they caught this morning. So the Inkahuma pride are on the elephant, and this is the Styx pride. So it's a different pride of lions. Uh, we don't see them as much as we see the Inkahumas, but it is great that they are on Cheetah Plains at the moment. Now, Fiona says, is it an optical illusion or are the Styx lions much darker than the Inkahuma lions? Uh, Fiona, I think it's a, it's a bit of a 
an optical illusion. They also were on a carcass this morning. So they could still have a bit of dirt and, and mud from that. Um, but the cubs are quite dark, but they will lighten. Thirsty, thirsty. And you would think they wouldn't be with those massive bellies they're sporting at the moment. Now, hopefully they'll start playing around shortly. But I think with those big bellies, we're not going to get too much action out of them. And there are quite a few vehicles waiting to get into the siphon. So what we can do is we can call Mike in, and then if there's a bit of time before it gets dark, we're going to come back. And we've still got a few more minutes. So we'll just keep enjoying the cubs for as long as we can. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, oh, he's just so fat. So fat. Oh, shame. Let's see how long he manages to last. I think his belly is so fat, he's really struggling to get a comfortable position to sleep in. Because, of course, he's got full of kudu, and as well as being full of kudu, he's now full of milk as well. Now, the clicking you hear is my camera. I'm taking a few pictures, and there's also another game drive vehicle here where there's a lot of pictures being taken, so there's a bit of clicking. And we encourage you to do the same. Click on a screenshot. And if you get some good screenshots, share them on our Facebook page, Safari Live, or pop them on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. Oh, so cute. Mike, Mike. Uh, giving itself a good clean. Oh, the little one's come out from between mom's legs. See if it tries to burrow back in there. Mike, Mike. So I'm on the Game Drive channel, and it's where, how we keep in contact and how we find a lot of these sightings is by being in contact with all the other Game Drives out here. Mike, Mike. Sorry about this, guys. Okay, so, well, we're going to enjoy. I'm just going to move the vehicle slightly. Hey, little monsters. Are we behind us, Chandra? I Retus would like to know how do we tell the difference between the two prides? So I've just seen the spectacular sky and I'm gonna try and get the lions in front of it. There we 
guy. Isn't that absolutely stunning? And to have a sky like that with lions here, and you can see <laughs> she's just rolled over. She is so fat. Oh, it's a very bemused look. Look at that. <laughs> that is a belly. I think literally if you had to poke that with your finger, she would explode. That is one of the fattest lions I've seen in a very, very long time. Mike, Mike. Very, 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 very fat cat. Oh, it's a very tired kitty. There's a very happy, happy pride of lions. Hi, Richard. Richard's wondering, uh, do lions get the majority of their liquids from mom's milk or they drink from water holes? And they'll get it from mom's milk, water holes, and, as, and blood on the kills. So lions are not actually water dependent, but if there is water available, they will take advantage of it. Isn't this just absolutely spectacular? We are so lucky to be able to spend as much time we do as we do with these incredible cats. And can you believe we are live from Cheetah Plains Private Game Reserve watching the Sticks Pride and their eight cubs. Okay, so we're going to sit here for a little longer. I just need to do some organization on the game drive radio. So while we do that, uh, let's go see what Tusked Beast Taylor has found. Oh, well. No panic, just so. Well, you won't believe what we just missed. We just had two beautiful uh, warthogs. Um who were just milling around, not so bothered, and then typical, very, 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 very That's camera right. shot. Good on you. Hello, everybody. So you're just saying hello to everybody. Hello. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we had these these wonderful warthogs, and they were posing so beautifully for us, which was really great. But uh, unfortunately. I think, yeah, they heard the word camera or live or something along those lines and they went darting off into the distance. So I think what we're going to do is we're actually going to carry on along this wonderful long road down ahead and uh, we're going to go and do a bit of a river cruise, I believe. It's exciting. I didn't bring my costume though, so I'll just have to get my clothes a bit wet. But um, off we go. We're going to carry on a little bit. So just uh, bear with us as we bumble along, you might eat a little bit of dust. It uh, seems to be quite a popular road this afternoon. Ooh. We've got uh, one of the other rangers just marking some tracks. We'll just give him a bit of room, we don't want to put him under too much pressure with all the cameras around. Hello, Kathy. Thanks for the question. Um, so your question was, how much do I rely on my tracker during game drive? Um, so 
it's at first time I've actually even worked with a tracker, which was quite nice. So I was very new, quite intimidated, um, but I'm very, very blessed. I've got the most amazing tracker in the whole world, but we're all biased about our own trackers. But I think he's wonderful. His name's Candy. Get a little shout out to him. And um, yeah, so he's really brilliant and he's taught me so much in, in the year that I've been working with him. So he, I rely on him quite heavily. Obviously, um, he sits right on the top of my vehicle over there. He's got a lovely little comfy chair. And um, what he'll do is, as he's driving around, he's obviously focusing on the road. He's not just focusing on tracks. He's looking for dung. He's looking for grass that's been pushed over in the morning when there's, there's dew that's set from the night before. All these small little signs that could indicate that perhaps um, an animal has moved through this area. So, especially when you're looking for cats, and uh, you've had a few vehicles driving over the roads. It's quite nice. Some of these guys have grown up in the area. Uh, so they have a really good natural instinct of, um, of, of where the cats could possibly be if we've maybe lost some tracks. I'm just trying to have a look just to see what was circled. And you see what was circled? Oh, apparently a little bit further on. So we'll go a little bit further. Warthog. Looks like warthog tracks, which uh, might be a bit difficult for you guys to see. It's um, it's really down below my vehicle, um, so not to not to worry. Unfortunately, we missed them. It must be from those same females that we saw uh, just before. I'm actually just going to pull slightly off the road. I see there's a there is a vehicle behind me, Shame, and uh, I'm not the fastest driver, so we'll give him a bit of a a bit of an opportunity to pass us, so sorry for the inconvenience. This is a, quite a popular road, so <clears throat> we've got a civilian vehicle coming on through here. We'll let them carry on. Cheerio. Maybe going to drop some guests off at a lodge, maybe going to pick some up and take them home, which I'm sure the guests wouldn't be too happy about. No one ever wants to leave when you when you come on safari. Now we can carry on. So I think what we're gonna do now this is quite a, a, a long, long straight road as you can see in front of us. Um, not too much happening at the moment. We, we're basically making our way to go and do a Sunset River cruise. Uh, so let's uh, see what's happening with Brent and the Lion Cubs. Look at that. See how that little cub is actually extended its claws and it's grooming the sheath that the claws go into. Look at that. Wow. No. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? So, lions, leopards, domestic cats have those retractable claws, and it is incredible how sharp they are able to keep them. Everyone's stopped feeding and there we go, a bit of aloe grooming or social grooming happening between the cubs and of course that's really really important in lion social dynamics. It reaffirms bonds and keeps the pride as a close knit unit. Uh, look at that, still cleaning those claws. 
Now, Rita is wondering, how do we tell the prides apart? And, uh, well, firstly, there's only three lionesses in the Styx pride, and there are five in the Inkahuma pride. Also, it's generally where we see them. The Styx pride are generally to the south um, of Juma and to the west of Cheetah Plains. They do come onto Cheetah Plains, uh, but it's generally from the areas. And the certain individuals, like um, the amber-eyed island lioness, are quite easy to tell apart. And the Styx are very big girls as well. The females, for me, are slightly larger than the Nkuma females. Oh yeah, so lots of cleaning and preening. And the tick is about to, oh. And they're all fat as little ticks at the moment. Massive little bellies, full of milk and meat. Oh, look at that lovely late afternoon light popping through. The clouds are giving the lions a nice little bit of backlighting. And there's the fattest lioness. Oh, she seems to have heard me. There we go. Oh! <laughs> Hello, Tucker. Uh, Tucker is four years old, and Tucker is watching Safari Live with us. Tucker would like to know, and he's a bit worried. He says, don't those baby lions know who their mommy is? I'm sure they do, Tucker, but with lions, they've got more than one mommy. So they will share milk between the moms, so all the, the, the lions are, are mommies to the whole pride, so they look after the whole pride. It's one of the reasons that they're a social cat. Let's have a look at this golden light. And there is the fat lion. We'll go scooting past that large belly towards the babies. Oh, let's roll over. Hi, Carol. And Carol says, does one of the lionesses have a skin problem like the Birmingham male? Um, I haven't seen on the lionesses, but some of the cubs, like that one there, seems to have a little bit of a, a skin problem. It could be mites, and it could also be a fungal infection. And it doesn't look to be harming them too much. Oh, boof. Okay, so guys, we've got to leave shortly to let Mike from Cheetah Plains come in to enjoy the sighting. Oh, look, a little Fenn and Grimace there. Gosh, tight kitty. Okay, so I can hear Mike's car on its way. So we're going to have one last look at these glorious little cubbies before making our way on to see what else we can find. So bye-bye cubs, bye-bye sticks. So the sun is getting a bit low and we're going to give Mike a chance to come in here and have a look at them before it's dark because we don't watch cubs with spotlights after dark. We'll leave them be. So while we move out, uh, let's go see how Taylor is fearing in the north, and we'll be back a little later. Welcome aboard the SS Juma. I don't know. <laughs> so we successfully made it 
into this um, dry riverbed now. So we're cruising along and it's actually really beautiful. This gives us an opportunity now to see some of the big species of trees. We've got lots of weeping bur beans, we've got jackalberries, we've got a massive leadwood actually just behind us. That is really spectacular. I'm actually just going to stop here for a second. Let's, let's appreciate the leadwood for a moment. Look at that. We don't see too many leadwoods of this side where I'm from. Unfortunately, the elephants have pushed them over and sort of dwarfed them. So this is really beautiful, beautiful to have a look at. Very hard wood too. So I wouldn't recommend making a boat out of this. Maybe use something else, like a marula. That's quite a nice one. I, when I was working up in Zambia, they used to have uh, dugout canoes, or they used to call them makoros, and they'd actually use marulas to make them. That's quite nice. We're going to sort of cruise on along through here. Maybe we get to see some bushback, maybe we see some anyala. This is quite a good area to actually see any of the animal species um, and particularly in the winter months. So during the winter months the animals have exhausted most of their food sources on the open plains and like we saw with the buffalo they're moving into the denser vegetation and obviously along a dry river system like this there's probably really great water not too deep underneath the sand. So you can imagine the vegetation along the banks of these rivers is quite green and you'll see that as we're moving along here. So that naturally attracts quite a few different species of animals that will come and do most of their feeding around here. So let's do one of my favorite things and so we're just gonna move along here very slowly. Oh we've got uh, some overhanging branches up ahead so uh, Watch your heads. Well, lucky for you at home, you don't have to watch your heads or anything like that. But uh, GPS on the back and uh, Dave on the camera, just keep uh, an eye out. We're going to do a very quick uh, wipe there. We, we, we seem to have got uh, some water on the lens as we came splashing on through this raging river. So just, uh, just important to give it a clean. That's what happens when you work out in Africa. Things like dust and all sorts of things uh, get into every nook and cranny. A lot of elephant dung around here. Should we have a look at this jackalberry above us? That's nice. So jackalberries are wonderful trees. And I know Brent earlier was hoping to see a leopard in one. And you, you actually do see leopards and jackalberries quite often. They've got beautiful branches. They actually grow out quite nice and horizontal. Um, so it makes for a good spot for a leopard to lie on. And they're very easy to identify. You can see how dark the wood is. The only one you could maybe get confused with in this area is maybe a weeping bourbon. Um, and sometimes they grow together on termite mounds. But um, if you look very carefully, you may even see a fruit starting to develop on this jackalberry. But I might be getting a bit excited. But I have been seeing a, fruit, a few with fruit. And... Um, Kathy, I believe, was asking about marulas, if I'm not mistaken, earlier. And this is another of my favorite fruits to eat, and which is also really good, which I sort of try and eat the animals too. So it starts off nice and green. You should start seeing them developing. And then usually by the end of July, sort of August, so soon, um, they'll start to go like a yellowy color, and they might, they'll fall to the ground, and they're delicious. You can... Uh, you can actually eat them, which is really, really nice. Very tasty, lots of sugar. This one, I can't seem to see too many more fruits. So, we'll see if we find another one with some fruits, I'll point them out to you, definitely. Maybe we even get to find the first one that's ripe and I get to taste it. Well, I think it's gonna be a really beautiful sunset this evening. These clouds have sort of thinned out again a little bit and, uh, and I'm sure you all know clouds make a sunset or a sunrise even better than what they'd normally be without any clouds. And as you're driving you also see lots of little game
Wasn't that wonderful? I'm so, I just get this amazing feeling of well-being after being with little lion cubs. They are just too gorgeous. But, don't tell the six ladies, I think the Inkuma cubs are prettier. Uh, shouldn't be judging, but I do, I do like the Inkuma pride. Uh, more than the Styx Pride, and I do think the Inkuma Cubs are cuter. They are a little bit younger, which always makes them a bit cuter as well. But it's really wonderful that we've got so many Cubs about. So we're going to start making our way back towards the northwest and see what's happening on Juma. We're going to quickly check around this northern sector of Cheetah Plains. where those leopard tracks were about this more, uh, the, earlier today, but they went into Nkoro. I'm just hoping they might have meandered back. You can see a beautiful evening light coming through. Always check the top of the termite mounds. Mr. Q's favourite spot to hide. Oh, I thought I heard something scurrying in the undergrowth there. It's a pair of red crested Korans. And. Yeah, sorry about this. Mike, I've left. Make your way straight in. So it is breeding season. They're not being the most. Show you for us. Now, wouldn't it be incredible if we catch the male in the suicide dance? Do you think Jean Ray is going to be fast enough on camera? I think he will. So, nicknamed the suicide bird. I'm not sure whether it's a breeding pair or a mom and a baby. Let's have a look. I think it's a mom and a baby, yes. Sorry, I didn't have a good enough look earlier. No, or is it? Yes, it is. Isn't that beautiful? A pair of Korhans. Now they're called the suicide bird because they have the most spectacular mating dance. It's amazing what men will do to impress the ladies. Uh, they literally will fly vertically up into the sky, close their wings and plummet to the earth and just before they hit the ground they open their wings and land. And of course the more daring the male, the more attractive he is to the girls. Okay, so we're going to start heading back towards Juma, see if we can scrounge up anything uh, in the north. Uh, while we do that, let's go see how Taylor's doing. So sorry about that. I believe we lost signal there. We are driving through a riverbed and we are in Africa. These things happen. But look what we've managed to come across. A lovely family of Nyala. And I'm not sure if any of you know this, but uh, they belong to a really fantastic family. And uh, that is the Trachelophus. So spiraled horned antelope. We can't see the spiraled horns now because uh, there's only adult females and then there's a few young males, but their horns are just starting to protrude out of their heads now. And uh, their color still looks very much like a female. But as they start to get older, you can sort of see it on this uh, the one just behind the big female, behind the fallen tree, is slowly getting a little bit darker in color. And as he gets older, he'll lose that orange tinge to his body and go more of a chocolate brown. Ah. You see that big female, she's uh, actually ruminating. It's just in front of us, which is quite nice. So she's taking a break from eating now. And if you look really carefully, you can actually see the cud going up and down her neck. But usually you see it nicely in giraffe, but because she's, she's quite kind and she's standing so close and she's looking at us, you can see her doing it every now and then. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and unfortunately, most of the animals don't have any table manners. They chew with their mouths open and loudly, but that's something you get used to. You can also hear the go away birds and things calling in the distance.
No, it's gone quiet. Typical. But what I really, really love about the, the Nyala in particular, out of the, the other species of antelope, the, in, in this family you have bushbuck and kudu, and then, of course, the Nyala. But my favorite is look at all their beautiful markings. They've got spots. They've got stripes. They've got different colors. It's pretty spectacular. And, and what I love about nature is nothing's random. Everything's there for a reason. So most animals, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is something that everybody has touched on before, but for the new viewers out there who are watching us for the first time, this is something very important to know about the bush, is that if you see an animal that's got spots or stripes or different colorings, as I've just mentioned, it actually helps aid in camouflage. So we call it disruptive markings. And it's very, very important to the animals. Because when they are standing, say, behind a tree or in front of a tree, those markings help break up the solid shape of the animal and this will help them blend in to the vegetation a lot better. So the more colors, the more spots, the more stripes an animal has, the better its camouflage. And I love them, they look like they've got little black boots on. Hello Roger, so you've asked if Inyala are in the same family as waterbuck and kudu. As far as I'm aware, waterbuck aren't in the Trachelophus family. Um, so it's actually just the Inyala, the kudu and the bushbuck. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually not 100% certain of uh, which family the waterbuck are in. I'll have to do a bit of uh, research, I can't think of it at the top of my head. Um, but yeah, they, they're probably more in the family of maybe Sitatunga, something along those lines. Once again, the waterbuck have got those baseous glands, and I know that the lechwe and the Sitatungas, which are very well adapted to water. So with that being said, those animals are probably in, in the same family group. But thanks for the question, that's a really good one. So she doesn't seem to want to move off. Just chewing away. Listening very carefully, you can see those ears moving independently of each other. So you can imagine, and I'm sure you've all seen kudu and bushbuck before. And the thing that you see first about them is those beautiful big ears. And that's because these animals are predominantly browsers. So they're relying quite heavily on their hearing in order to hear a predator through this thick vegetation. Sometimes it's quite difficult to see a predator. So they need to listen out very, very carefully. And you'll see them even when they're moving around, they're very dainty. They're always looking where they put their foot, making sure they don't stand on a leaf and crush it, which is, which is very important. They don't want to give their, their presence away. They want to stay hidden too. But this is a very, very good area for a leopard to hunt. So I think what we're going to do now is we're going to carry on driving along here just for a little bit longer. Maybe we do get lucky. This is the time that a leopard could wake up from its slumber and start moving along. Like I said, the animals are doing a lot of feeding. Here's the proof. Um, and maybe we get lucky and we find a little leopard that's been hiding away. I think uh, let's shoot back to Brent and um, see what he's up to. I hope you all enjoyed those lion cubs. I'm envious. So we're off Cheetah Plains now. We're now on Gowrie Main, which is the main access road to the east. And we have Cheetah to our left and Torchwood to our right. And we have a zebra. You can only see one at the moment, but two. There we go, as I was about to say. Where there's one, there's normally more. Oh, it's lovely light. It's just that golden hour in Africa at the moment. Look at that, isn't that spectacular? Let me just get the aerial out of the way for you there. How's that, Chandra? Oh, I, it's so gorgeous, I'm going to take a picture. Come on, lift your head. Now you almost want the zebra to oh, there we are, walk and you get that brilliant dust. that lovely backlighting on a striped donkey. 
We'll get ready for that wonderful dust. There's another vehicle coming. So the zebra might move. Oh. They are incredibly, incredibly striking animals. Uh, that black and white coat. Its ears are alert. Now it's looking at the vehicle behind us. It doesn't look like it's taking too much notice of it. So the, vehic so the vehicle is just going to go past there in a bit of a rush. Cheers. There we go. And fortunately, it's a very short vehicle. So <laughs> look at the zebra. Oh, we got a fright uh, as the vehicle went past. Unfortunately. But he did have a very bemused look on his face as that vehicle kept coming past. Well, he stepped out of the golden light, unfortunately. Well, you can see that grass and it's, oh, it's all gone now. Now, if any of you out there have horses or have ridden horses, a lot of the behavioral signs in zebras are almost exactly the same as a horse when they're upset, when they're scared, uh, when they're relaxed. So, very, very interesting that you, well, of course, they are quite very closely related. Uh, although zebra is more closely related to a donkey rather than a horse, but behavior wise, it behaves more like a horse than a donkey. There you go, let's find some more grass. What species is that, Jean Andre? Can we zoom in? Can we? Oh, no, we can't see what species of grass it is just there. Now, zebras are bulk grazers, so they're not too fussy about what they eat, and which is probably a good thing in the current drought. Now, because they're of their way their digestive system works, zebras always look very fat, even if they're not healthy. So one of the best ways to tell if a zebra is actually losing condition is their wonderful mane. Now we can see how upright and vertical that zebra's mane is. Now, when they start losing condition, that mane starts to flop. And that's probably the best way to tell uh, if a zebra is not in good nick. Okay, so we're going to keep going. We've got to go through the Mulwanini River, uh, which we might lose a bit of signal. But Taylor has found one of her favorite creatures, and I'm sure she can't wait to share it with you. You will not believe. Finally, 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 just as the sun is about to disappear. I found my elephants after they tortured me the whole afternoon, just leaving tracks and dung. And now we've come across this wonderful little herd of elephants. They're quite spread out at the moment. And there's a little one lurking in the distance. And I can see a big cow. And we've got a, that we're looking at at the moment. And then we've got a very young, inquisitive bull approaching our vehicle. He's munching away. So. I actually cannot contain my excitement. Um, I, I cannot tell you how much I love these animals. They're really, really, really beautiful. So intelligent. So I'm going to sit and have a look with my binoculars. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you for tuning in to us, and I hope you continue watching. Remember, everybody, this is all live. So Jamie's just asked a question, and he asked, how long do elephants live in the wild? This is quite an interesting question because it's not as simple as it seems. So I'm going to do a little bit of talking. I apologize. I'm going to steal the show from the elephants. But we'll, we'll get back to them, I promise. And um, so basically, Jamie, what happens is an elephant's age is actually determined in 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 the right scenario. So it's, it, it's not sick, it's a healthy elephant. And basically an elephant has six sets of teeth. And um, so essentially every 10 years or so, a new set of teeth moves up and moves forward like a conveyor belt. So you, as you know, when animals eat different types of vegetations, it starts to wear their teeth down. So depending on what type of vegetation they're eating, this will determine how long they live. So. If an elephant, like now we're experiencing a bit of a drought, so the food isn't as lush and green as what it normally is. Um, they probably, if it continues for a number of years, this will have an effect on it. But for, for a short period, they should be all right. But an elephant can live anywhere between 
60 to 70 years, give or take a little bit. So if there's anybody out there that wants to become an elephant dentist, there's a career for you. You know, you could make some nice dentures, and I'm sure they'd probably live a little bit longer. So they don't starve to death. That's very important to realize. It's not a, a, a quick process. It's a very long process. So you heard earlier from Brent how he asked the question, how much does an elephant bull eat on average? So I'm sure he told you about how they eat about 5% of their body weight. So what happens is as they move on, as their teeth start to wear down, and once they get to that last set of, uh, of molars, is um, they, they're not able to eat as much as what they normally would. So it might start off that they're eating only 4.5% of their body weight every day, then 4%. And you'll also even see them moving, feeding along these, dri these river systems, drainage lines, or going to dams where there's a permanent source of water, because then usually there's a few you know, trees that are quite green, the vegetation is a bit softer. And over time, the elephants slowly start losing weight and become malnourished. And, and then this is eventually how, um, how they die. Oh, we've got the, the little one playing around. We'll see if, if this young bull that we were intently watching, if he moves up and over the bank, then we'll be able to maneuver on in to have a closer look at that little one. But I just don't want to block him off from his mom and upset him unnecessarily. And he's actually hiding behind the trees at the moment, not giving us really a good view. You can sort of just see the trees moving. It's a bit like Jurassic Park at the moment. But you can hear him, which is quite nice. Hear him munching away. So I'll be quiet for a little bit. So I think, let's see how he is. Let me just start a vehicle and see what this elephant's reaction is to us. Maybe he'll allow us to inch on a little bit forward. They seem very relaxed. Ooh, that was good. I'm just going to go back a little bit. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to reverse. And we're going to go up this little bank here. There's a little road we can take. Which I think... Oh, there's a few other men up here. This is actually much better. Fantastic. Yeah. We've got one having a little dust bath. Just going to move around just a little bit just to get a little bit. going to go too far off the road, I don't think. Hello. Um, I like to talk to the, to the elephants. I think that they can pick up on your tones. Let's see what's going to happen here. Hello, cheeky. So we've got one that's uh, just sort of showing a little bit of an agitation, but it's it's a relatively young elephant, so maybe just a bit un, unsure about the vehicle still. So we'll give a little bit of room, settling down now. Gone back to eating, which is good, good for us. Hmm, is that nice? Look at the thorns on that tree. It's incredible to think that they can munch on such big thorns like that. Young female. But just in the direction that this female is actually going, she's heading towards a, quite a young calf. I'm going to just remember again. Bear with me, please. Because she's kicking up some roots, which is quite amazing to see. It's okay, relax girl, we're just here to watch you. You're beautiful. So I think I'll just, we'll just hang tight here. She seems to be a little bit nervous of us, but she settled down again now. Look at that. Oh, beautiful. Let's see. Hi Betty, so you've asked us why, if, if, a, if the elephant's tusks or teeth, why are they not shed and, uh, and regrown? 
That's a very interesting question. I don't actually think I've ever been asked that before. So you, you've stumped me a little bit, but I'm going to try and answer it for you. So an incisor, I mean, so the tusks are a modification of the incisor. So they're not used like teeth are traditionally used. They're, they're more used for a digging tool. Um, so I think over the years, you know, with them being able to grow and last a bit longer, it enables them to dig for certain things like water. And I, I think that they, they don't need to lose them because if they keep losing them, they lose the ability to dig for, for water or loosen a root, something along those lines. Um, so I think it's just an evolutionary um, process that's happened over a few years. But I, I will actually do a bit more research on that and uh, and and see what the actual answer is. But that's, that's just my personal opinion. Um, but thank you. It's nice to have a few questions that um, make us think. You know, that's, what's, that's what keeps us excited and, and keep on learning. It's important to get these questions that we're unsure of. What is she, what is she munching around? Has she got a nice root? Roger, I like your question. So Roger's asked, are there any other animals other than elephants that would be able to dig in, in the waterbed? So I don't think so. Other than maybe a monkey or a, a primate of some sort, um, I don't think a warthog has got tusks, but I don't think they have the ability to dig down and scoop out the mud like a, um, sorry, like a, an elephant would. So, so yeah, I think, I think it's just the elephants. We saw it quite a bit in, in Zambia where the elephants would come through and dig these massive big, what they call elephant holes in the rivers. And a beautiful, lovely, fresh upwellings of water will come through. And, and elephants prefer to drink lovely, fresh water if they have the opportunity to. And we, you'd often see things like zebra and waterbuck following them. And once they were finished drinking, they'd make use of these holes and drink from them too. I've seen leopard doing the same thing, drinking in a, in a fresh elephant uh, hole before. And that was actually down here in the, in the sands. Um, so I think the animals actually rely on elephants a lot, especially in the drier seasons when there aren't a lot, when there isn't a lot of uh, fresh water av available. If I was an animal, I'd probably just follow the elephants around. They break the trees down, which you know might allow you to feed on vegetation that you couldn't normally reach, and then of course they pr can provide you with lovely water. So, thanks for that, Roger. Ah, she's got a root. She's digging very deeply for some roots. Look how she uses her foot and the combination of her trunk. She blows the dust away, the soil away. So as everybody's been saying, in winter it's very important that the animals are able to dig down and feed on the roots or on the bark because that's where all the nutrients are being stored in the winter months. A lot of the trees lose their leaves and elephants are very lucky in that sense. But they can dig for the juicy roots, which I'm sure have quite a bit of moisture in them too. Hmm. Look at that. So I'm going to keep encouraging all of you all have the wonderful opportunity of coming on safari. Make sure you get yourself a really good pair of binoculars. Like I said earlier, you can get so close to these animals, but you won't believe what you're able to see with a pair of binoculars. Look at that wonderful, really, really wonderful, lovely. Munching away, very happy. But where, oh, here's our little elephant. Here we go. This is the one I was talking about earlier. Coming to, to learn possibly from maybe a, an older sister. Oh flicking the sand about. Thomas from Corrado. Hello and welcome. Thanks for watching. So Thomas has asked, do you each elephant footprints have an, an individual unique characteristic to them like we as humans or like zebras have 
unique stripes or we have they have the fingerprints i'm unsure of this but i can imagine that every foot is is very different i don't think every pattern every crack is uh, is the exact same as the other there might be a, a slight difference so i would say yes i would say i don't think anybody any of the elephants have the this exact same footprint i'm just going to move a little bit forward you're just going to see how she reacts again just so you can get a little bit of a better view of this little one hi gail Mm, little ones disappearing. We got a little bit windu bashing. There we go. You got a little bum shot, but it's a cute bum. Oh, shake that sand off. Look at that. That's the boogie out in Africa. <laughs> there we go. You can try that at your next disco. Maybe I'll do it a bit later. She's really enjoying herself. Yep, another little tidbit. So these elephants are just going to carry on munching the entire day. So elephants, not only do they eat 5% of their body weight, but they usually graze and browse for about 19 hours a day which is quite a lot, which is sort of how they feed you at Safari Live. You never stop getting food. Oh, and I really wish we could... <laughs> Marianne, so I have your question, sorry, your firstly, your question was why do we never see birds landing on elephants? I have, in fact, and I can only talk about Zambia because I, I did work there for a little bit. We saw a lot of cattle egrets riding the backs of elephants, moving through the wetlands. Um, but other than that, uh, the, maybe the occasional brave drongo might swoop down and land on, uh, on the back for a little bit. But that's true. You don't see too many um, birds sitting on elephants. But, but definitely cattle egrets and sort of north of South Africa where it gets a bit more marshy so I'm sure in Botswana you'll see the same thing so have a look out for that maybe even try if you can google a photo it's it's quite humorous that little one oh, I'm hoping that he comes back around here because he's he's so funny to look at he's pushing trees over he was rubbing up on a, a branch earlier but I just don't want to upset this young female too much oh here we go he's coming back around again come on Come on a little bit so we can get you. He's just started just behind the little greenery that you can see on the left hand side of the screen. You can sort of see his movement as he moves around. I think he's a bit bored. No one wants to play with him. He's got a little bit of energy. He doesn't want to go to bed. And now he's gone again. Kim has asked a question. She's asked, is, she said she can see that the ground is quite sandy. Is it difficult for the elephants to dig? Well, where this female elephant is digging now, as you're seeing, it's a little bit harder. If you look just towards her back feet, you can see there's a little bit more of a sandy region. Um, but you must remember in the sandy soils, you don't necessarily get as many vegetation, as much vegetation growing. Um, so she's just sort of digging just on the outskirts where the soil seems to be a little bit better. It looks like it's got a bit of clay in it. I could be wrong. And, um, and yeah, she's found some plant. I can't even tell you what it is that she's digging up. Maybe some, I don't know, bulbs and there's all sorts of roots. But they've obviously munched the surface already. Um, so yeah, no. That's, uh, it's not too hard for them, and, and if it does get a bit tough, they're armed with those wonderful tusks, which are so hard that they can almost, you know, dig on through. It might take them a bit longer, but eventually they'll get there. Hmm. 
<laughs> Wonder where that little chap has gone. Can't see him anymore. I was hoping to get you a little glimpse of him, but sometimes... Oh, look at that scratch. Here we go. Elephant yoga for you. That's, that that's, was almost a downward-facing elephant with a combination of a boogie. So maybe maybe she's got a dance uh, rehearsal a bit later that she's practicing for. She's put, you know, I'm not sure. We don't know what the elephants do at night. <laughs> Richard, are there any big tuskers in South Africa or are they confined to East Africa? Actually, there are some massive big bulls in this area, especially in the Kruger National Park. There was once um, a few elephants that went by the name of the Magnificent Seven, which should ring a bell and um, sort of indicate that they, they must, have been, must have been quite large. So yes, they were massive, massive elephant bulls. If I'm not mistaken, there was one where its tusks almost weighed about 50 kilograms. Unfortunately, some of these elephants, either they died of natural causes or unfortunately they were poached. Um, and I believe in the northern sectors of the, the greater Kruger area, they've believed to have found um, some of these elephants that have have this magnificent seven or this woolly mammoth genetic it's okay girl i'm just going to give these ellies a little bit of space in case they want to come through here yeah? oh and we've got our friend come running through hang on ladies we're just going to give you room so you can come here but i think that female who's the mother of this calf has come through and quite liked what this younger female is munching on but i hope that answered your question so yes there are some beautiful big tuskers left in Africa, but um, unfortunately I think they've realized that they need to stay hidden because um, poaching does still exist in this area. I haven't been too fortunate to see any huge tuskers. I did see one or two up in Zambia, but if you look hard enough and you spend enough time in the bush, you will be lucky enough to see them. There's my little one. Hello. Oh, copying mum. Oh, they've settled down again. It's important as you with elephants. They, they're really graceful, gentle giants, but you've got to give them a bit of space. So if they show any signs of them being a little bit agitated, move back a little bit, then switch off. And as you can see, they've settled down quite nicely. They're all feeding now. And if an elephant is eating, it surely can't be an unhappy elephant. Look at that little one reaching up. Now, let's see, that's going to be a difficult one to feed. If you haven't got a very well-trained trunk, you might get a little prick here and there. Oh, we're having a dust bath now. We're going to have a quick look at this female having a dust bath. And then we're going to actually, unfortunately, have to say goodbye to the elephant soon. Just because it's getting a little bit dark, but this is too good of an opportunity not to watch an elephant have a dust bath. And we got the other girl coming back around again, just doing circles, just make, coming back, making sure, haven't missed anything. Come on, give us a nice big cloud of dust. As a, maybe what will happen, they'll do a big cloud of dust and then they'll disappear. It'll be like a magic act. But one can only be hopeful. Oh, I'm going to dig right here. <laughs> little one coming through again not not moving too far from mom just staying by but it's also it's important to have a good good interaction with these younger elephants so that they learn not to be too scared of us and become relaxed with us so i'm very happy with what we've done i think this little one has probably learned a lot from today while we're watching the behavior of the other elephants by mom and older sister by the looks of it so let's head back to Brent and see what he's up to. Maybe he's got a nice sunset. I'm not sure.
So, jean and I have been discussing where we're going to place trail cameras. Uh, we know we've got one site, but now I'm trying to think of another site. So, jean if you see anywhere that looks likely, what a, maybe that big jackalberry tree on Gari Cut Line. Hmm, so many decisions. I was just making sure they're all working and batteries are in. It's going to be exciting to see what we catch during the evenings. Trying to think. I'm really excited to get some sort of little movies of the nocturnal creatures like civets and genets hopefully uh, maybe even serval or caracal and of course leopard i am hopefully not too many hyena near the camera traps even though they have got a steel case hyenas are are, are not good news for camera traps yes yeah, it's, yeah, it's true Uh, curious ones, am I not worried about elephants? I am, but normally I'll just put some elephant dung on them. Uh, it generally does the job. Another, another trick is you, you spray mosquito repellent on it. They don't like that, so they tend to leave them alone. I did have a honey badger attack one of my camera traps once. Uh, unfortunately, that camera trap got attacked by the honey badger uh, and the next day got eaten into a thousand pieces by a hyena. And the hyena even managed to unfortunately bite through the card, so there wasn't even great footage of the hyena chewing it. Now, we can be quite clever where we put them. We can put it in the area, although the elephants do wander everywhere. You want to avoid sort of big elephant paths that are really regular, regularly used by the elephants. So there's that big jackalberry. I want to see. Um, if that one's fruiting, it's going to be a good spot. Hi, Jamie. Uh, Jamie is wondering what we might see on the, the, the camera traps that are, are rare to see on drive. Well, it's a lot of the little nocturnal stuff. So uh, serval, possibly civet, almost definitely, um, honey badger, uh, genet. You, you never know what you're going to catch. Who knows, we might even catch a sable. So, unfortunately, that one sable that arrived at Juma a while ago, and that used to be seen on, in coral quite frequently, uh, wandered a little bit further to the south into Mala Mala, and unfortunately got eaten by lions. So, he was the only sable bull I know of. I've seen them in the Manileti, not too far from Juma, the Juma boundary. So there's a possibility, especially now that it's so dry, that we could get a few more of those interesting creatures coming down. Let's go have a look around here, see if there's a good spot to put one up. Mm, let's see if it's got fruit first. Does it look like it's fruiting to you, jean -Ray? It doesn't look like it's fruiting to me. Nope. I've got a good idea. I definitely know where I'm going to put one. Maybe I'll put one in the DRC so we can see the evening hyena visits. That could be quite fun. And and the, the bushbuck, shh, don't tell Brian about the bushbuck. Uh, I don't, uh, you might have heard that, shh, don't tell Brian about the bushbuck. I think we should call the, the bushbuck, shh, don't tell Brian. Uh, so Brian likes to consider himself a gardener and he planted a bunch of sunflowers outside his room and uh, the bush bunk came and literally took them from about this high <laughs> to this high and all the one flower that had flowered while he was on leave has also been munched. Poor Brian's poor garden. 
Now, a lot of you probably, and I have been asked before, wonder why we don't have our own vegetable garden out here. And there's a very good reason. Uh, it would get eaten, and not only by bushbuck, or porcupine are great munches of vegetable gardens. That's another creature we might catch on the camera traps. Hello, Impalalas. Aren't you all looking very sprightly? Mm, lovely big herd of impala. Off you scamper. And there we go. Big, big herd, probably about 30 or 40 of them. Just taping a quick check, see if anything is coming down to Juma to have a drink. Now, Romy's wondering how high we mount the camera traps because how are the hyenas supposed to get to it if it's high in the tree? See, the problem with that, Romy, is you miss out on a lot of the little creatures that walk around, like genets and civets. So that's why I've had these steel cases made. So I can put the camera trap in it. Oh, sorry, Inyala. <laughs> Off you scamper. Um, so we can put the camera trap in it. So it's probably about one mil steel. And I mean, if a hyena really wanted to, it could probably crush this. But I'm, I'm, I'm going for the sort of, it's, it's too much of an effort, so I'd rather not. Mm, exciting, we'll see how it, how it works. Now, I have lost camera traps to many different animals uh, in my years in the bush. And when I was working in the rainforest in Gabon, we actually had about 60 camera traps that we used to use for great ape, great ape movement. Uh, so, like, to try to figure out where the chimpanzees and the gorillas were, as well as all the other creatures. And uh, we actually lost a few camera traps to chimpanzees. They stole them and walked off with them. We actually found one, like, four months later, uh, randomly in the middle of the forest. Oh, this is the bumpiest section on the road, aren't you, Matt? Okay, we're off. No, 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 not yet. Ah, now we're off. Uh, the, the elephants during the last rains created those bumps. They had a big party in the road and made it very, very bumpy. Uh, and when we, the one nice thing is as well, I think once we know where a hyena den, a hyena den comes back with a steel case, we're going to able to put it into a hyena den and that would be absolutely fascinating to watch the behavior while no one's there. Okay, so we're on our way around towards the little pan behind, uh, next to Gallego camp and because there's water there I'm thinking we're going to get a lot of traffic of different animals. Okay, here we go. near the spot. Now I just got to figure out what tree I'm going to put it on. Let's always make sure there's nothing at the pan. Let's see what tracks are around. See anything up there, Jandre? Okay. Uh, nope. So here's this big animal path. So what I want to do is I'm going to put the trap just off to the side here. And anything that's going to be walking down towards the pan or down this major thoroughway here. And I'm going to choose a tree that elephants don't like to eat. It's probably quite a sensible thing to do as well. So I think we're going to put this one up here. And there you go. Okay. Oopsie. Oh, sorry about that. That was my mic fell. Sorry, John. I must have given you a very loud noise in your ear. I apologize. Let's put it back. 
Okay, so now the reason we want to set it low is to try and catch some of those little critters. Okay, am I attached? No, I'm not pulling anything, breaking anything. So let's just have a look. I think I'm probably going to set it Brrr, to you too, elephant. Some Ellie's making a noise over there. And I think I think that's a good spot. What do you think, Chandra? Because it's going to catch both paths. Okay, so let's open it up. Have oh, you got a lens cloth there, Chandra? I mean, just give it a quick dust on the lens. Make sure we don't have specks in the way. Thank you very much. Okay, so the first picture and movie is going to be of us because I've got to turn it on <laughs> to put it in the box. And unfortunately, that means we are going to have a few pictures of us. That's not too bad. Okay. Pop it there. How's that look, Jandre? Straightish? Oh, I'm making a hash of this. Let's get, there we go. Let's get the lock through there. Let's get a little bit lower. Use the rope to just, whoopsie. There's a nice video of my knee at the moment. Oops, I'll we'll fix that now. And that should be okay. Now you don't want to leave any strap or anything hanging loose because that's just something for Aina to pull on. I'm going to try to make sure there's almost nothing visible. Just tuck that in there. Okay. And often a useful thing is just a stick to put behind. Let's make it straight. Here we go. So it's going to be very exciting to see what we're able to catch on that camera trap. I'm, I'm hoping for something really interesting. Oh, buffalo. Coming to have a drink at the pan. Hello, old boys. Okay. Good thing I got my camera trapping done before they arrived. So I think our first stars of the camera trap are going to be some old buffalo balls. Now where to put the next one is the question. So I, think I quite like that position, it's getting multiple animal paths converging and it's in a tree elephants don't like to eat. So while we switch on our night lights and see what else is around and get our spotlight ready and hopefully find our friendly bush babies. Uh, let's go see how Taylor's faring. We've just stumbled across this beautiful kudu bull who was a bit skittish a few minutes ago but he's settled down quite nicely now and he's munching away having dinner or third or fourth dinner. I'm sure he's going to carry on, carry on munching away. They do quite a bit of feeding in the evening. Surprise, surprise. They don't necessarily sit down and sleep like we as humans would when, or monkeys do when the sun goes down. Let's see if he comes back up towards us. Maybe he pops out on the road and gives us a beautiful silhouette. Let's see. Just taking his time. Here he comes. Keep your eyes open. There he is. Look at that. 
What a beautiful boy. So much power in those shoulders. Look at that neck and that beautiful sunset in the distance. What a lovely, lovely set of horns on him as well. You can get quite big there, horns. An average length is about 1.2 meters. Sorry, my conversions are pretty terrible into feet. But he's now moving off out of view. And we're going to bring the spotlight out, which I think is a good idea. Well, I think we're going to leave this kudu now as he moves on off. We've sort of lost, lost visual of him. We don't want to pressure him too much. So we're sort of just bumbling along now. We haven't picked up any tracks of anything. We did see some old line tracks earlier, but um, I think those were the, the ones that they uh, located, that uh, Birmingham mail that Jamie was talking about this morning. So just a reminder for you as well, any of you that are new watching us uh, for the first time, We've got this wonderful spotlight and our vehicle is lovely and kitted out with all sorts of lights. But, ooh, but Bumpy, please don't um, stress if uh, you ever do go on safari and your ranger as the sun goes down sort of skims over the top of a big group of eyes. We, we try not to shine on any of the animals um, that uh, are not nocturnal. So nocturnal means animals that are more active at night and then of course something like that kudu is a diurnal species. So. That means that the that the sorry <laughs> G, G, right. GPS says right. I almost had to uh, do a U-turn. Um, sorry. So so what we're going to do is we're basically going to be looking for some special creatures that come out at night. So anything from an owl that would be quite nice if it was one perched up on this dead tree over here, or we're looking for things like bush babies which I believe Brent is always on the lookout for. And uh, honey badgers, which maybe we get lucky and catch on one of those camera traps. Janets, civets, white-tailed mongoose, which are always good to see. Any of those little critters. And I'm sure there'll be the odd night jar in the road that I'll have to try and avoid. So the reason why we don't shine the light directly into the animal's eyes, and especially that our diurnal animal's eyes, is because as the the sun disappears the animal's eyes has to start adjusting to this darker light and you know at twilight it's very very difficult to see for us as humans and your mind sort of plays tricks on you well this is a very similar case with the animals so it's important to not do that otherwise if you do shine it in the eyes for too long it's okay if you do a little quick glimpse just to make sure that it's not a leopard and maybe it's a common daker pretending to be a leopard that happens often so if you shine it for too long, so I'm losing my trail of thought here, it can take sometimes, in some cases, up to 45 minutes for the eyes to be able to readjust to the dark light. So taking a long time for that vitamin A to start reproducing in their eyes. Like little common dark here over there, which we're not going to shine on. So just always keep that in mind. It's not because we don't want you to see the animals. It's just we can see them during the day. And we'd prefer to not blind them and... Uh, not give them the opportunity to escape from something like a leopard or a or a lion. So we're looking for a leopard. That would be nice too. We've been hot on the heels for two game drives now with a few tracks, but um, nothing really has prevailed. But maybe we get lucky tonight. I think I've got a bit of Irish in me somewhere along the lines. So maybe that can pull through for us this evening. You just do a little scan. It's always good to also take it easy at night because if you race around, you are going to miss things. So we'll just do a slow little drive. That's quite nice. It's not too cool tonight here. Yeah, I'm not sure what the weather's doing in the rest of the world, but it's quite pleasant. I've just got a little green jersey on and it's really lovely and fresh. No, not really too much wind. Just a slight breeze, which is quite nice. Talking about trackers earlier, this is one thing I haven't done for a long time, use a spotlight myself. My wonderful tracker usually shines away from me. So you'll see me swapping hands occasionally, it's just I don't have the muscles. Uh, 
to do it anymore. I'm going to have to uh, pick up a few, few weights. So we have a question, if I can, sorry I didn't get the name there, if, see, if you can just give me the name again. Curious One. Curious One. Curi oh I like the name, very mis, mis I, I, I want to know who you are now. I'm the Curious One. Anyway, sorry, so you've asked, speaking about muscles, can I change a tyre on my own? Well, when I first started guiding in the Eastern Cape, we weren't blessed to have trackers. I used to do it all by myself carry the big heavy cooler box, uh, anything, you know, wash the vehicle, do it all. And one of the things we had to do was change a tire. Now, fortunately, there's these, uh, they're wonderful, but they're also not so wonderful devices called high lift jacks. And we as females have to use our body uh, weight in order, in order to use them correctly. And they can be quite dangerous if they're not used. So it takes quite a bit of practice. But yes, I can. Uh, you have to learn a technique that sort of suits you. Uh, and into how to pick the tire up and put it back into the vehicle but you know you always have a strapping young man on your vehicle that's willing to help um, and make us not do too much work, hard work but but it's quite nice to show the boys that the girls can change tires too so yes yeah, curious one and I'm very, like I said you've intrigued me as to who this mysterious person is Hello Vicky, so you've asked what do I think about the Safari Live concept? Well, as a young girl, something that I really, 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 really loved was watching all these wonderful wildlife documentaries. And I think this sort of project that's going on over here, the show, is, is an incredible way to touch people from all over the world. You know, unfortunately, not everybody is able to afford a safari. It's quite a costly um, process. So in order for people to be able to sit back at home and every afternoon and every morning sit and do a game drive, that's amazing. Boy, we've got, sorry, you guys, I'm just going to shine away. We've got a few elephants, and the elephants don't like the light too much. So, yeah, so I, I absolutely love it. I wouldn't be here, I think, if I didn't agree with the concept. I think it's, it's great what they're doing. They're also so involved in community projects, which is um, uh, really amazing. Sorry, girl, I mean to blind you. Uh, so, so, yeah, so it's not, not what, just what you're seeing, what we're doing on the ground. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes work with the community projects, you know, giving back, which is also really great. So I love it. I think it's fantastic. So unfortunately, everybody, it's uh, come to that time of the day where we have to say goodbye. So I just want to say thank you once again for all your support today. The butterflies have finally started to settle just as the, the drive's about to end. But uh, I'm going to head on home and remember to catch us tomorrow morning. And I hope to see you out there and, and I hope to see you guys soon. So have a great night and uh, thank you for tuning in. I think Brent wants to say a little goodbye, so I'll see you guys maybe in the future. We'll see. Have a good one. So we've had a bit of a traffic jam in the dark here, and it's the half-eared Ellie, and she's just walking past us. Oh, hello, little monster. Here we go. Hello. Yes, you're very, very naughty. Behave yourself. Off you go. So I really like this female who's only got half a year. We're not going to stick with them because it is after dark and sometimes Eddie's are not the biggest fans of spotlights. Now what I did here was a very upset water thickening. So what I'm hoping is there's a civet or whitetail mongoose down here and that's why I was responding to those alarm calls. And if they sound, you know, thickening sounds a little bit calmer now. Oof, lots of Ellie's all over the show. There's that thickening calling. 
So come on, maybe a Janet, maybe a honey badger. You never know. Maybe a Karula. It's not sounding as upset as it was a little while ago. Hi, Tasha Michelle. Tasha is wondering how long am I going to leave the cameras up before checking them? Well, Tasha, unfortunately, well, fortunately, I have uh, I don't have great patience, so I'll probably check it every day. <laughs> but I'll I'll leave the camera there. What I'll do is I'll I'll take a little. Um, I think I've got something that I'll be able to. I'm trying to think if I've got one. Otherwise, I must get one. A little card reader for my iPad. And we pop the card in. We can see immediately while on drive, uh, what was there the night before. So, whatever scared those th thick knees has done a disappearing act. And it has been a wonderful, wonderful evening so excited I got to see the sticks cubs uh, definitely worth and the long haul down to cheetah play what was that uh, I would say bush back so we're not gonna shine on it a real fun little owl Valeria, and I know lots of you are can't wait to see footage from Rwanda. So uh, it is with our editor Alan. So he has prioritized that. So I'm not sure on the exact uh, time frame, but you will get to see some footage r relatively soon. I'll try to find out for everyone. You see something? Oh, it's Grub here. Oh, sorry. Hello, little scrub hair. Off the little scrub hair goes. Come on, let's find something before the end of the safari. Chandre, what are we going to find? A bat. That would be a good one to find. Don't know how I could spotlight the bat. That'd be quite difficult spotlighting a bat. No bush babies. My favorite bush baby spots let me down. Maybe they went the other way this evening. So I think we're gonna put the other camera trap up. Um, either at the DRC or outside Ingers to see what comes to visit us in the dark. That could be quite fun, see what comes into camp. And uh, hopefully we catch some little nocturnal critters frolicking about. Now, it's been wonderful having you. It's about to be the end of the sunset safari. And uh, tomorrow morning we'll be out on the sunrise safari and we have another interviewee, Ryan, who will be taking his drive tomorrow morning. So be nice like I know you all will be. But from Jandre, myself and the rest of the crew, it's been absolutely amazing. And uh, bonne nuit till tomorrow.